Hello. Hey. Uh, thank you for wel welcoming the Trojan horse into the bank. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're here to destroy you, apparently. So uh, thank you for having us here. Um, I'm the host of the What Bitcoin Did podcast, which is uh, one of the leading Bitcoin podcasts. And I have some of the best and leading minds in Bitcoin on to talk about the future and sometimes just to talk about the history as well. And uh, thank you for having us here. We've got a really great panel. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Tell us what you do, what your background is in Bitcoin, and why we should care. Hi, I'm Jörg Hermstorf, and I uh, started in looking into Bitcoin in, in 2010 when I heard first of it, because I'm interested in the stability of systems. So any, any systems I can find in the universe or on the planet, I'm interested in the stability of, of system and if they lead to a stable system. And I realized that uh, Bitcoin solves a 40-year-old problem in computer science, which is the Byzantine general's problem, where nobody really had a satisfying solution before. And then um, I yeah, consider this a very interesting thing to, to follow throughout the years. So that's um, more uh, the, the theoretical background uh, on the system. Yeah. Stepan, we uh, met for the first time yesterday, did an immediate yeah. interview yeah. talking about quantum physics and the birth of the universe and Bitcoin, so... Uh, and multi-universes, yeah. Multi -universes. And, <laughs> and everything is not real, yeah. Everything yeah. is like uh, probabilities and stuff. Uh, yeah, uh, you already know, I already said who, I'm, who I am. Basically, a hardware hacker. And Dan, I've known probably for about a year now. Yeah, about a year. About a year. I uh, built some early products in the cryptocurrency space back in 2013, 2014, um, I'm currently building institutional trading uh, accounting infrastructure, and I've written some articles on the game theoretic attacks against Bitcoin in terms of how Bitcoin mining works and how uh, certain sort of game theory might play out uh, with financial rewards in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Great. Okay. So we're here to talk about security and risk within Bitcoin, and in planning and pre preparing for this, we realized there's two types of security to consider and two types of risk. But also, I had a good chat with your guest today, and we talked about some of the things that you need to understand with Bitcoin because it is very different from anything else that you might have experienced before. And most people, when they first discover it, go down a rabbit hole of education that can take them, some people, years to really understand the background and what it means. So, York, do you want to talk about, there were four things we spoke about yesterday you think it's important for people to understand. Yeah, I think, I think Giac Giacomo highlighted it, that um, it's not enough to just be an expert in, in one field, how we classically derived when, when somebody grows up and decides for an education, then he becomes a specialist in a certain area. But these areas have been defined like 100 years ago. Yeah? And today we have in, in, in computer science these new phenomenon that you cannot only be a good computer science and how to build uh, these decentralized networks, but you also have to know economics because there can be economic attacks on, on uh, decentralized systems. And you have, a, to have to have a good understanding of physics because this is the, the link between the virtual world and the real world. It's the physics. Yeah, You need at least a good understanding of the second law of thermodynamics. And, of course, mathematics that you have a basic understanding if you're really using um, mathematical secure algorithms or if they have a, a loophole which can be easily exploited by, um, by smart algorithms. And Dan, we talked about security, and there's two key areas of security we need to consider. There's the security of holding and moving and transferring Bitcoin as an asset, but there's also the security of the protocol. That's right. So on the protocol, there's two types of risk. I would say there's technical risk, which is the code itself, and then the game theory that is enabled by the code. Uh, for example, the game theory around Bitcoin mining, why Bitcoin miners would rather accept the block reward or the financial incentive to mine rather than manipulate the transactions. Um, that's an example of like more the economic theory or the game theory behind Bitcoin. So we can we can dig into that or what would you like to talk about? So, so talk about, I would separate the two. Talk about the security of the protocol and what the inherent risks are and how the protocol is secured. And then I would also then talk about the security of the asset itself, whether you're personally or as an institution uh, holding or transferring it. Yeah, I think we can, this might be a good moment to touch on the custodial risk. Um, you know, Bitcoin is like gold. It's a bearer asset. Um, if you lose your gold or you bury your gold in the middle of nowhere and you forget where you buried it, then it's gone forever. Uh, with Bitcoin, similarly, if you forget your password to your private key, 
it's going to be gone until the end ends of the universe, maybe. Um, and so that that's a tremendous risk when it comes to holding Bitcoin. It's also a huge value as well, which is that by having something that only you control, you have sovereignty over that value, you have complete control over it, which gives you freedom, the freedom to lose it or the freedom to keep it. And there's also risk in transferring the asset as well when you're sending to somebody. Yeah, it's irreversible, which means when you send a transaction, there is no undo button. So if you send it to the wrong person or you send it to the wrong address, it's kind of gone forever. Uh, with one exception, if both parties agree, then they can reverse. So it's, um, it's true. You can build on top of, of that uh, frameworks that uh, ensure reversibility if uh, there's consensus about it. Stepan, you talked to me quite a bit yesterday about security of the Bitcoin protocol in terms of quantum uh, attacks, but you were also working on a hardware uh, facility. Do you want to talk about the different types of ways that people actually can secure their asset and the risks inherent in that? Uh, didn't quite get it. So, so, so there's different ways you can hold the asset. You can, yeah. you can. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I would say that uh, it is well. Hardware is important, obviously, and this is what why we are doing all this research. Uh, but also another important thing is uh, like uh, when you hold it, how exactly you do it. So there are techniques uh, to protect the private keys, so like using the multi-signature schemes. Uh, maybe you can uh, give out some. Uh, control, well, not control, but uh, a certain recovery keys to another party, to the trusted. So you can introduce trust in the setup if you are not trusting yourself. Because, I mean, I don't trust myself. Uh, I can easily get uh, hit by a truck and then, well, what could I do with it? Uh, so uh, it is important to think about what uh, other threats are there and what, uh, how to recover is an, another important point for Bitcoin uh, holding. Already got some really good questions coming here, so we'll cover these towards the end. Um, Bitcoin has been here now for 10 years. We're pretty proud of that, um, but I think everybody admits that we don't know what the next 10 years will hold. So, Dan, we've talked about what some of the potential big risks are that could even kill Bitcoin. Do you want to talk about those? Yeah, I mean, Bitcoin has survived a lot of different attacks and a lot of different risk early on in its life cycle. If you think of Bitcoin as a species of money, uh, when it was planted, it has survived its early youth when it was very fragile, very weak, could have been easily trampled or destroyed by a storm. Uh, Bitcoin has survived a lot of those, but I think Bitcoin still has much ahead of it that is still risky. Um, Bitcoin's proof-of-work mining mechanism uh, secure, uh, essentially secures the network. And right now, that security budget or the annual sp amount spent on Bitcoin mining isn't high enough to stop a large country from potentially destroying it. Um, so that would, I would consider a pretty, still a pretty big risk that it has in the future. Do you st think there's any inherent risks in the protocol itself? We've heard about inflation bugs. Do you think that is still a significant risk that we should be aware of? Yeah, so on the technical side, there's different problems that might exist with the code, or there might be a bug in the code that would enable someone to print more than 21 million Bitcoins or do something else with the protocol. You know, there's a very large reward for a hacker to attack the protocol. Um, in fact, what's the market cap of Bitcoin today? Uh, uh, two, 200 billion? Not yet. Not yet. 150, is it? 150. So a, a hacker has a $150 billion reward if they find a flaw in the protocol, which is a very, very good incentive for the engineers who build and work on the protocol to continue to fix it. Uh, so that is kind of an interesting dynamic that only open source money protocols like Bitcoin has is that it's essentially a reward if you find a flaw. And in the 10 years of Bitcoin, how many times has the protocol been exploited to create fake, fake transactions? Very few, and they were earlier on. Uh, one was in 2010 when Bitcoin didn't have any value. So that one was uh, an inflation bug. Uh, but that's when Bitcoin had no value. So the And there's very few people working on it, so that was a long time ago. Uh, I'm not technical enough to answer how many other times there's been, but very, very few. 
But this is basically the reason why Bitcoin uh, forks and uh, I mean Bitcoin soft forks and Bitcoin upgrades are happening uh, well very rarely and they normally take like years. So like from the moment when you start specifying it to the moment when you actually release it as you are kind of releasing the product that holds uh, 150 billion uh, whatever fiat money, uh, it's actually, uh, well, there is an intensive to verify everything and to uh, really to look into what you're uh, deploying. Yeah, Bitcoin is known as very conservative when it comes to an engineering mindset for good reason. Uh, if there's any sort of, if we try new and exciting things without testing them, without talking about them, it could lead to a big flaw being, uh, you know, in encoded into the protocol. So the Bitcoin community and the Bitcoin uh, developers are very, very conservative. You know, we also spoke yesterday about uh, the inherent risk with Bitcoin with market manipulation, also and the potential for systemic risks. Uh, if Bitcoin continues to grow and goes beyond uh, the last uh, peak market cap and becomes a multi-trillion dollar market, if it ends up competing with gold, it becomes intrinsically linked across the whole market. We have derivative products. If there was some catastrophic bug or a currency in Bitcoin that would lead to a market crash that could have uh, a chain effect across the whole, f the entire financial market, similar to the housing crisis. Uh, yeah. So one good thing is that Bitcoin goes not uh, goes there from one day to the other. So the more it uh, evolves into that future, more and more people have a look at it, and everything is open. So we have more bright minds looking at it. This is a good thing. And uh, but. Also, the more people have an interest or are invested in it, they will probably protect it because it's like a win-win network for everybody. And um, an attacker probably would not gain the, the full bounty because the price would immediately crash. Right. So he would have to be very uh, careful. Whether it's a technical attack or even an economy, uh, um, economic attack, the cost of attacking it are so high that it's probably not worth it. And um, Unless the attacker actually want to destroy the whole thing, because yeah, yeah, but then he probably would use up all his bu budget and have a country full of people who are angry at him because he didn't use that money for for other stuff and just to destroy <laughs> it. You're talking about a 51 percent attack, for example. Which, yes, the the attacker would have to be willing to burn the money, uh, which is why the game theory behind it is so interesting is that miners have put their own skin in the game via financial investment with the mining machines and electricity, and that, how much they spend on that, essentially secures Bitcoin through the game theory of if they were tried to damage Bitcoin or damage Bitcoin's, um, and it, damage Bitcoin's reputation in terms of the, uh, you know, manifested via the price, then they would have to be willing to burn those future cash flows that they would earn. So I, yeah, I think if you want to attack systems, there are more profitable systems to to attack than, than Bitcoin and to exploit. Yeah. yeah, Bitcoin is the strongest out of all of them. Yeah. We've got some really good questions here, and they've all come through from an anonymous people. So you're obviously learning about identity with Bitcoin, which is great. Um, some. Oh, great. Okay. Um, there's a question here that says, how large is the risk that one big investor could change the protocol and manipulate it? Uh, I think we'll switch big investor more to anybody. Yeah, uh, people who hold Bitcoin don't control the protocol. So an investor can't really sway the protocol. They could invest their money in mining equipment and decide to try to do a 51% attack, but they would have to be willing to burn $5 billion to do so. Well, I would say that uh, anyone can fork Bitcoin, right? So if uh, someone is uh, unhappy about the rules uh, of the protocol, they can fork and we have plenty of altcoins. And then the market shows uh, if it is valuable or not. So we have this, uh, well, different person, people that are trying to fork and uh, put their vision into uh, Bitcoin protocol, but uh, it didn't work. So I think that uh, it's more like a community driven system and it is really great. Uh, this is a really good question, and Dan, I think it would help if you explain the difference between custodial and non-custodial here so everyone understands, sure. but the question is, with the continuous consolidation of Bitcoin custodians into fewer and larger ones, will this introduce the same systemic risks 
like the consolidation of bigger banks? Yeah, that's a great question. Really good question. Which is that uh, custodial would be that you trust someone else to control your Bitcoins for you. Non-custodial means you don't trust anyone else to, to control your Bitcoins and only you can control them. There's pros and cons for both approach. If you do non-custodial and you lose your password, you lose your Bitcoins forever. Um, custodial, you trust someone else who's typically smarter than you are to manage your Bitcoins. Uh, these are really, really smart engineers that typically work on these, these different wallets that are custodial. And this is a great question, which is that, will humans choose a more convenient method of storing their Bitcoins, which is typically custodial? Will they choose a more convenient method over time, or will they choose the uh, method where they have complete control? And I think, I think we are seeing, if we look at chain analysis data, I don't think a majority of Bitcoins are held in custodial solutions. I think they're actually held in non-custodial. So that's a good sign. And I don't think we see it trending one way or the other. I'm not, I haven't heard any new data on if we're trending to more custodial or non-custodial. In the future, there are ways to develop something in between, which would be like a multi-sig or multi-signature setup, where you don't have to trust any one other individual party you can trust multiple custodians, and you just have to trust that they all won't collude together against you. And so I think that's a nice compromise in terms of user experience and control over your money. Yeah, and can I add on this? Um, you also have to differentiate between systemic risk, yeah, where everybody is affected, mm. or uh, specific risk, which are there, of course, and, and you talked a lot about it, that it's essential to keep the private key, whatever, how big your group is, that. Uh, agrees on we, we join forces to to limit it, uh, the individual's risk, but it's um, it's a big difference if there's a systemic risk where everybody has to pay for the for the errors of a few people um, to just keep the society working. Yeah. So um, and and then you can still agree if you uh, want to help individuals who who uh, made a mistake and lost something, but it's not forced on everybody. Um, yeah, that's a good point. It's not necessarily a systemic risk. It's more of just individual keyholder risk. So it doesn't actually pose a threat to the protocol itself. It poses more of a threat to the individual holders of their crypto assets. I really like this question. What would be an effective way to make Bitcoin go away? I really like this question because um, <coughs> China, with all their might and power, have tried to make Bitcoin go away and have failed. But, uh, and every time you try and make Bitcoin go away, you make it stronger. But how could we make Bitcoin go away? Great, but something which is even better. So compete with Bitcoin on the market that uh, people realize, I want this instead of, of Bitcoin. And it has very uh, good properties, uh, way better than, than Bitcoin in all the areas, not just in, in a single area. What m most people do, they say Bitcoin has, has a problem here and uh, doesn't scale at this point, and then they uh, m propose a, a fix for that, but uh, it breaks the system on, on the other end. So you have to really have something which is better in all of the areas, and not just uh, one uh, little bit better, but maybe 10 times better. And then people take that effort to investigate it first, because it takes a lot of uh, time, human time, to, to research this, and then make the decision uh, to switch to something even better. Yeah. Dan, I've got a feeling you don't think something could be created better than Bitcoin, because it's more <laughs> than technical. Uh, all money is a social money. The only reason why the euro, the former Deutschmark, the US dollar ever had value is that we all had this shared illusion or shared trust or belief that it was worth that value, uh, especially considering modern fiat currencies are not backed by gold or anything substantial. It's just pure faith in it. Bitcoin similarly is a faith-based system of shared people who, sh who believe to take their money in the real world, their fiat dollars, and invest those into Bitcoin and to store that in the Bitcoin ledger. And the only reason why Bitcoin has any value today is the shared belief between all the people who own Bitcoin that Bitcoin is worth something. So I think the way to attack Bitcoin, the way, made it, the way to make it go away is to attack the social network. If Bitcoiners are divided on a, an issue that's big enough, you could try to fork the protocol and hopefully divide that social network into two pieces the network is most valuable as one. And the more and more participants in the network, or the more and more people that believe in Bitcoin and choose to store their wealth in Bitcoin, increases the value of Bitcoin. And so if you can fracture off part of that community or a substantial part of the community, that would be a good way to damage Bitcoin 
in a in a pretty devastating way. Uh, Stefan, are there any uh, more technical I ways? I think that uh, it is a good point that uh, on this system the weakest part is actually the human beings. Uh, so by uh, well, but also right now it's this question is kind of similar to how do you make a internet go away? Uh, so uh, at the moment, uh, Bitcoin is not very widely used. So there are still possibilities to use maybe regulations or marketing or anything like that to uh, just push people away from Bitcoin. But as soon as more uh, infrastructure is being built and more services are using that to do their business, it will become harder and harder. So I think that it's like on the one way you go with the adoption and uh, everyone is uh, suffering. How do we make Bitcoin more uh, well, penetrate the ecosystem, penetrate the society? And yeah, the attacker can do the other way around. So how can we uh, can the damage the reputation of, uh, of Bitcoin? Yeah, and well, we are constantly under attacks like that. So uh, up to now, we survive. So. <laughs> It, I mean, it's impressive how much Bitcoin has survived. I mean, imagine when Bitcoin has positive news in the press. When was the last time you read a positive article about Bitcoin? 20K. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe around the price, but That's not it. many people are very optimistic about it. And I think there's a very small amount of people that believe in Bitcoin right now. Maybe maybe 20 million people have bought Bitcoin in the whole world. Maybe. I think that's a really important point. So I, I was at the Oslo Freedom Forum last weekend, uh, hosted by the Human Rights Foundation. And a lot of the conversations there are about how people are using Bitcoin, living under authoritarian regimes. And I think a lot of people get lost in the whole uh, spirit of price and speculation and actually forget that uh, Bitcoin is also a tool for freedom. So I think that's super important. Yeah. Um, so what is the best way to learn about Bitcoin? So there's this podcast. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So um, if you want to learn about Bitcoin, I've always found personally, I'm going to answer this very quickly, uh, Jameson Lopp has a website, lopp.net, L-O-P-P.net. You can embed yourself in his resources page for a few weeks and learn a lot from that. And then I would go and watch all of Andreas Antonopoulos' videos on YouTube. And once you get a bit more competent, then start debating Giacomo on Twitter. Um, but... Be prepared. How about you guys? Best way to learn about Bitcoin? You know, that's a tough question because it's like, hey, read this collection of Medium articles or these articles and read and watch these YouTube videos. I think those are a good place to start. I think Jameson Lop has a really good kind of uh, index of different different knowledge in the space. Uh, if you want like a basic, if we're going to do self-promotion here, like the podcast, if you want to learn some of the basics around Bitcoin's origin, I wrote an article called Planting Bitcoin, so Bitcoin's origin story. That Satoshi's brilliance wasn't just in the species of tree that he chose to plant or the species of money. It was his the season, the soil, and the gardening techniques that were equally as important to lead that led to Bitcoin's success. So that's kind of a good intro to like where Bitcoin started, how it started, and why it's important. I would also add that uh, probably the best way that I think, uh, well, for me at least, is, uh, would be to go to the local meetups. Uh, because, well, as soon as you have someone who can explain you and answer your questions, because there will be plenty of questions about Bitcoin technology and uh, how it uh, all works. So if you can uh, grab something and ask him, it will be very useful. And in the community, people are extremely friendly. So uh, you can ask uh, dumb questions on the Stack Overflow, on, or, I mean, yeah, Bitcoin Stack Overflow, or uh, anywhere in the uh, IRC chats, and people will try to explain you uh, in a nice way. So And it is not only about the technical questions, but also like in the uh, overall things. But uh, like for general understanding, local meetups are really great. So you can meet great uh, people there and uh, get a lot of information out of them. Yeah, I can't answer this question without a bias because I have a founded a Bitcoin education or blockchain education company. So we we're all shilling right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we streamlined uh, this process that you can get a, a good uh, start into the net, net on the whole thing with six hours of your time and get into the the most important basics at least, and then be out there on your own. And uh, the problem is nobody knows every uh, everything about Bitcoin and nobody probably will ever. This is a network thing and we have distributed knowledge always uh, as a species. So you can only have different perspectives. And uh, But it's a network which holds these experts together that we have thousands of eyes looking at it and uh, everybody tries to make up his mind. 
Yeah, it's just like the uh, no one knows how to make a pencil. Have you heard about that? Like yeah. no one no one knows how to go mine certain elements that are needed for the pencil. No one knows how to do all the wood manufacturing, et cetera. The same thing. We all know how pieces of it are built, but we no, no one knows how the whole thing's built. Um, I would uh, support going to read Dan's work too. It's probably some of the most accessible, easy work and something that's very technical. Uh, just last thing, because we've got about 30 seconds left. Uh, excluding the Bitcoin people who have been at all the events this weekend, just out of interest, can I just see a show of hands of anyone who's bought Bitcoin? So there's a few. Okay. The, one of the best ways to learn is actually just buying some, going buying some, moving some around, having a hardware wallet, playing with it. Because in playing with it, you suddenly build up an intrigue, and that, that's what happened for me. Yeah, but you, by buying some, you mean 0, 0.00 something, right? By loads. <laughs> um, so can we just have a round of applause for our panel?